is living on land that was once the home to hundreds of thousands of indigenous people. Since time immemorial, they lived in ways that respected the web of life and the more than human ones who depended on it. I am living on the stolen lands of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations myself, and as a settler with European ancestry, I am learning the shared history of this region in order to walk in a better way. I am grateful for the ways in which Indigenous people cared for the life-giving water, the ancient trees, the abundant sa salmon, and so much more. Gifts that are now threatened by a value system that sees them mostly as resources to be consumed. I came across this piece of history just this last week that I thought I would share with you tonight. If you've ever been to southern Vancouver Island in the spring, you may have been fortunate to see the beautiful blue camas lilies in bloom, especially, especially where there are remnants of Gary Oak Meadows. Camas have tasty bulbs under the soil and were an important carbohydrate for First Nations diets pre-colonization. Historically, Indigenous women employed expert cultivation techniques to help Camas Meadows thrive, such as the cultural burns which were outlawed by the provincial government. Camas thrive in the Gary Oak ecosystem, which is unique to British Columbia, but 95% of that ecosystem has been lost. Ethnobotanist Nancy Turner estimates First Nations on Vancouver Island and the smaller adjacent islands may have once harvested as many as 10 million camas bulbs per year. They cultivated for abundance and understood their responsibilities to harvest honorably. At a Coatzin village site on Salt Spring Island, the mountainside was once covered in thousands of camas, which turned it blue every spring. Pre-contact population was thought to be around 15,000 people, and in her research, Turner found that even just a few decades ago, everyone at a Coatzin's feast would have had two or three camas bulbs on their feast plate, putting food stores in the tens of thousands. Today, just 40 camas remain on the mountain because much of the Gary Oak ecosystem has been cleared away. Most Indigenous people have not tried camas, though some older people have memories of it at when they eating it when they were younger. I'm here today because of colonization, and going forward, I am committed to supporting Indigenous perspectives and aiding in bringing awareness of and uplifting the current generation of Indigenous peoples who are catalysts for a decolonized future. I imagine a world where everyone is indigenous to place, where earth and all her beings are seen as kin, and where once again, canvas is eaten in the feast halls. May it be so. And I have the pleasure of introducing Ruth because Ruth Walmsley is to lead us in some spiritual grounding this evening. Ruth is a member of the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers, and a passionate activist for social justice and environmental justice. She is the mother of two adult children. In September of 2021, her concern about the climate crisis motivated her to engage in spiritually rooted, nonviolent civil disobedience as part of a multi-faith prayer circle direct action group, which she founded in 2018. This led to her arrest and incarceration for nine days at the Alouette Correctional Center for Women in BC. For Ruth, singing with others is a source of great joy and an increasingly important vehicle for merging her spirituality with her activism. Ruth. Thank you, Susan. And uh, it's my honor to offer some words of prayer and, and a song to begin our evening together so maybe we can just start with a breath and just a moment of silence great spirit of all life thank you for this opportunity for us to all be gathered together in community, to listen, to learn, and to share with one another what is in our hearts. We come together this evening with a heavy awareness 
of the great tensions and pain which is manifesting in the world right now. We pray for relief for the suffering due to violent conflicts and environmental disasters. We know that what lies at the root of this suffering is our disconnection with the earth and with one another. We pray for our hearts and minds to be opened to the reality that all of creation is truly interconnected. In the words of Lewis Thomas, there are no solitary beings. The whole planet is one giant living, breathing cell with all its working parts linked in symbiosis. I'm inspired by the words of Thich Nhat Hanh. You, you carry Mother Earth within you. She is not outside of you. Mother Earth is not just your environment. In that insight of interbeing, it is possible to have real communication with the Earth which is the highest form of prayer. I'd like to share a song with you that I learned this summer at a Quaker gathering in Oregon called I Am the Ocean. It's quite short, so I'll sing it through three times and I invite you to sing along with me in your own space, even though we're all muted. Um, hopefully you can pick it up as, as it goes along. I am the ocean, the ocean is me. I am the seaweed, and I am the sea. Everything opens as I open me. Everything opens as I open me. I am the ocean, the ocean is me. I am the seaweed and I am the sea. Everything opens as I open me. as I open me. I am the ocean, the ocean is me. I am the seaweed and I am the sea. Everything opens as I open me. Everything opens as I open me. Thank you so much, Ruth. 
a beautiful beginning for all of us in this world at this troubled time. I have the pleasure, I'm, my name is Janet Gray, for those of you that don't know me, and I have the pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker for this evening. I was fortunate this past year to immerse myself for months in a book that I also had the pleasure of talking about and studying with a group of seven friends on a weekly basis. As, season, as, a season, as seasoned climate activists, we all have a lot of collective grief for this world. And this book not only acknowledged this grief, but challenged us to sit with this knowledge, talk about it, work with it, and face what's coming together. It was and is a book for our times. It is a workbook because we all have a lot of work to do. The author of this book I speak of is, of course, our keynote speaker this evening. Dr. Vanessa Andriotti is the Dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Victoria. She is a former Canada Research Chair in Race, Inequalities and Global Change and a former David Lamb Chair in Critical Multicultural Education. Vanessa has worked extensively across sectors internationally in areas of education related to global justice, global citizenship, critical literacies, indigenous knowledge systems, and the climate and nature emergency. Vanessa is the author of Hospicing Modernity, Facing Humanity's Wrongs and the Implications of Social Activism and one of the founders of the Gesturing Towards De Decolonial Futures Arts Research Collective. Dr. Andriotti is a big picture thinker. She is a gifted educator, and we are thrilled and honored to have her speak with us this evening. She is a prophet of this time. Vanessa presents everyone she speaks to with a challenge to grow up, step up, and show up for ourselves, our communities, and the living earth, and to interrupt the modern behavior patterns that are killing the planet we're part of. She is a midwife assisting with the birth of something new. What will this look like? Take a deep breath, listen deeply, and see where her words and ideas take you. Over to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Janet and Ruth. I'm still very, I'm still a bit shaky <laughs> with the song. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna try to calm my body so that I can do this in a good way, or maybe this is part of it. <laughs> um, my name is Vanessa Andreotti. I, I come from a, a mixed heritage family with uh, both German and uh, indigenous ancestry uh, from Brazil, but I, I identify as a settler here in um, Lakwangan speaking uh, territory of indigenous people's territory, especially the Songhees and the Squamaut people, as well as the Husseinage and other Lakwangan speaking nations that surround the place where uh, the University of Victoria is located. Uh, and uh, the Guarani people uh, of my mom's side have also taught me a different language, land acknowledgement that is a, a day long, and <laughs> we're not gonna go there. We're gonna just do a, a, a very short version of it because there are four different acknowledgements that, that need to be made before I can start this um, where it needs to start, which is uh, from my body, which is also the land and the sea and the seaweed. Um, so the first acknowledgement is the acknowledgement of the land as a living entity, not a property or a resource. Uh, in a land that is currently uh, facing many challenges uh, in terms of its ability to keep us alive in the long term and other species as well. Um, the second acknowledgement is the acknowledgement of our ancestors. And ancestors are those who have come before us, but also those who are yet to come. And we are also ancestors in the making. Uh, so there's an invitation there to become good elders and good ancestors for all relations. And this means sometimes working with the ancestors who have come before us 
and saying the buck stops here uh, for some of the things that have happened, as well as bringing the ancestors who are yet to come into the conversation and, and having them have a space um, amongst us. The third acknowledgement is the acknowledgement that um, we're here because other people uh, have worked and the land has worked for us to be here. The ancestors have conspired for us to be here. And in this acknowledgement, we acknowledge all the indigenous people who are the custodians of the territories where everybody here is located. And we also acknowledge uh, the violence, uh, the systemic and structural and historical violence that has taken place to allow us to even have this communication using this technology. So thinking about the communities where this uh, minerals were mined and our responsibility to interrupt that violence and, and, and other forms of violence that are erupting right now. We are in a moment that is very difficult. There's a lot of suffering and, and a lot of pain that is going on in the body of humanity and the and metabolism of the earth. So be pres being present to that pain is extremely important and developing a different relationship with that pain is also important. And the last acknowledgement is the acknowledgement that we're all a big family of human and non-human beings. We are just points in a continuum and that um, as with any family, it's a, it's a difficult <laughs> situation uh, in, in terms of family relations, but uh, at this point, uh, our human uh, actions are actually putting us on the path of premature extinction. So what we there is a call for us to be together right now that is not the same call that has been issued before. This is a very different call uh, where um, the future is at stake. So in, with this spirit, I'm going to share a few things um, about the work of the collective that I work with, which is the gesturing towards the Colonial Futures Collective, and then invite you to a conversation uh, after that. And I, I aim to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, or depending on how it goes, it can be even a little bit less. But I'll, I'll share my, uh, my PowerPoint with you. If I can find the, hmm, the, um, the thing that shares the PowerPoint, I cannot find it which is interesting because it has to found it. <laughs> I've done this so many times and it always gets me. Okay, so here it goes. So the title of the presentation today is Harvesting Hope in a Time of Drought. And we will actually be talking about hope uh, more towards the end of the presentation. Before that, I'm gonna try to take you on a journey. And I need to acknowledge that all this work that you are seeing here is not just my work, it's the work of a collective and we will talk a little bit about that uh, in a second. And um, there are three things that uh, if, if you want to, to look further into what I'm saying, there are three resources that uh, I'm showing it now and I'm gonna show it at you at the end as well. The first is the book, Hospice Modernity, that is the basis of this work, but there's also a report called Moving with Storms, Climate and Nature Catalyst Program of, um, of the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies at UBC. This is the report of the last year, 2022-23, uh, um, where we had a program about the Climate and Nature Emergency centered on um, seeing the Climate and Nature Emergency as a uh, as having its origins in colonialism and capitalism. And in the program, we try to amplify indigenous critiques of the climate uh, crisis and amplify uh, the voices of indigenous people in terms of solutions as well. And then lastly, there is this uh, Facing Human Wrongs course, which is called uh, Climate Complexity and Relational Accountability, which is offered through UVic to the community. And we're going to talk a little bit about that there too. And what I'm going to do is just send you the PDF um, with all the slides, but also the links if you want to know more about these resources. So uh, as 
uh, was written in the invitation. In the invitation, you had this quote from the report, uh, from the Moving with Storms report, that says that the world as we know it is unsustainable. We are in a state of overshoot, consuming more resources than Earth can regenerate, and polluting beyond nature's assimilative capacity. This will force a series of major adaptations and almost certainly lead to reduced standards of living, both in Canada and in other countries of the so-called global north. Uh, prevailing economic systems dependent on continuing economic growth are likely to be challenged and much remediated, both in response to overshoot and a growing clamor for justice. And this was a letter submitted to um, the UBC Campus Vision Strategy from the Emeritus College, who were part of the program of the Moving with Storms Catalyst program. So it was, this was really interesting, and I'll just uh, say this as a, an anecdote. We had six cohorts in the program. So we had a cohort of undergraduate students, 12 of them, a cohort of graduate students, a cohort of artists, a cohort of scholars, a cohort of staff, and a cohort of um, of emeritus in emeriti um, who are uh, retired academics. And uh, each cohort worked uh, with their own uh, people throughout the year, but they had lunches every month where we all got together. And each lunch was hosted by one of the cohorts. So the first lunch that we had was hosted by the undergraduate cohort. And um, as hosts, they could put questions on the table that they wanted people to discuss. And the questions of the graduate cohort were very hard questions. So they wanted to, people to talk about, for example, how is your discipline, um, which is, could be STEM, math, English, how is your discipline complicit in the creation of the climate and nature emergency? And most of the people who were there uh, including graduate students and other scholars. Nobody wanted to talk about that. They wanted to talk about solutions and to talk about positive things. So the, the undergrads who were the youngest in the room uh, felt really um, upset about that. And what happened that day was that the emeritus cohort, the cohort of retired professors, um, also came to talk to the, the, the younger people and said, why are you being so negative? And throughout the year, the cohort, uh, we, we started calling them the cohort of elders. This cohort of elders really, really committed to listening to the science, to the climate science, to the research about climate change. And after a year listening to, or eight months actually, listening to the science, they became more radical than the students themselves. So they were not asking the question anymore, why are you being so negative? What we saw in the last lunch of the, the program was the elders apologizing to the younger people for not having seen this earlier and saying like that they, they were sorry that in their careers as researchers, they allowed what's happening to happen. And for the young people, it was so important to hear that and to see this connection between the youngest and the oldest in the cohort uh, in, in a way that uh, they really felt supported. So we invited them then to record a session where they would be, um, it, it, in the end, it was not talking to each other, but talking about their perspectives. And we have that recorded. I can put that uh, on the chat at the end of the presentation. But this was one of the things that really moved uh, moved me to uh, emphasize the importance of uh, multi-generational and intergenerational conversations about this topic. What happened to the people in the middle, like the, the artists did their own thing. They, they were a separate category, but the scholars, the staff and the graduate students, uh, they didn't have the same kind of, of, of shift in perspective. Also because you have your careers, you have you are much more invested in the current system than people who are either starting or at the end of their careers. So there, there were lots, uh, lots of lessons there about um, 
the availability or the willingness of people to sit with the difficult questions. But sitting with difficult questions is actually what we're going to be talking about today and our capacity to uh, hold space for difficult things without feeling overwhelmed, immobilized, demanding quick fixes, or to be rescued from discomfort. That is the starting point for us to be able to work together, for us to be able to coordinate in a different way, to pose and solve problems in different ways. And that is a very difficult educational question. So what I'm gonna do uh, today is just take you into a journey of the kinds of work that my collective does in that regard. And uh, here, though, actually, there was a question at the end of this slide. Um, this being today's reality, how do we prepare ourselves to tackle the problems of our time, including unprecedented complex dilemmas and disasters of our own making that we'll have to face together? And I will tell you from the beginning that we have a, a provisional response from our collective that is called SMDR. And SMDR is a compass. And this compass is about emotional serenity or slash sobriety, uh, relational maturity, intellectual discernment, and intergenerational responsibility. And we will come back to this slide towards the end, but we will enrich this understanding and talk about what we mean by these things towards the end. So I'll start by talking a little bit about the collective that I work with. It is a transdisciplinary, multi-generational collective of researchers, artists, educators, students, and indigenous and Afro-descendant knowledge keepers uh, from both the global north and the global south. We work at the interface of questions related to historical, systemic, and ongoing violence on the one hand, and questions related to the unsustainability of our current modern slash colonial systems. The collective brings together concerns related to racism, colonialism, unsustainability, economic instability, wealth disparity, global mental health crisis, climate and biodiversity catastrophes, intensifications of social and ecological violence and inequalities, and the likelihood of wider social and ecological collapse. So these are very, very, very heavy issues, and that's why uh, amongst us, we have had to create containers that are light and compassionate so that we can carry out this work in a good way. So we are engaged in educational and artistic collaborative inquiry, and we have these experiments in arts and education that build containers for the expansion of our collective capacity and stamina to face difficulty and pain and navigate compli complicity and complexity without feeling overwhelmed, demobilized, demanding quick fixes or to be rescued from discomfort and without drowning in sadness, anger, frustration, guilt or shame. So while we recognize that the vulnerabilities are unevenly distributed in this work, we, we have this commitment that to, to saying that no one is left off the hook. This is a humanity problem. So it's a commitment to when we have a critique, this critique implicates ourselves, even if you are Black, Indigenous, or a person of color. So there's no uh, romanticization or essentialization. We are all implicated in this. This is a humanity problem. And we have, uh, we work with loop reciprocity, which means that any income that we generate from talks, workshops, and courses goes back to uh, the network of indigenous communities in Brazil and in Peru who inspire and who support this work. So I'm going to just show three of the people in the network, three of the leaders in the network that, that are at the forefront of the uh, fight uh, against colonialism in climate change mitigation and adaptation uh, that really inspired the talk today. So one of them is Chief Ninawahu Nikui from the Amazon, Acre in the Amazon. He's a global advocate against the financialization of forests. He also is an advocate against carbon trading in the Amazon. Maria Yara Querar is from Peru, from Valle Sagrada in Peru. She's a community leader who is working with the protests against lithium mining in indigenous territories. Lithium mine, so uh, Peru opened up um, the, the mining of lithium uh, in order to, to resource uh, the green transition in the global north. 
And Mateus Tremembe, who is from Ceará and Brazil, he's a national leader against offshore wind farms and indigenous waters. And he's also a, a very strong uh, indigenous food sovereign advocate. So these people are not just helping us intellectually, but also relationally. And generally what we have is, for example, when we have courses with more people, they are doing ceremony in Brazil or in Peru while we are, we are working here with people to try to open the channels so that the people can start uh, connecting and listening to the land. And for that to happen, we need to put our egos aside. We need to decenter our egos. We need to disarm our defenses. We need to declutter uh, our distractions. We need to disinvest in harmful uh, conditioned desires so that the land can speak and dream through us. And that's why we don't say that we are birthing something new. We are just helping midwife it. It's the land itself through the, our bodies that are also land, but it's the land uh, and the conscience of the land that brings about uh, how we're gonna heal from, from, from this disease uh, that we are facing right now. So in this collective, I, I talked about uh, the, the collaborative inquiry that we have. Our starting point is that um, the, uh, the uh, indigenous knowledge is about uh, relationality and, and the, um, the critique of colonialism is what really inspires us. So I'm bringing in the voice of Chief Ninawa here, who is saying that colonialism is a cognitive, affective, relational, and neurobiological impairment. Uh, he's, he's been talking about it uh, as a degenerative disease based on illusions of separation that have damaged our relationships with our own selves, with each other, with other species, and with the land or the planet we're part of, with deadly consequences for all involved. And that while Western society has developed advanced STEM technologies, relational technologies of respect, reverence, reciprocity, and responsibility have been neglected. And he said that the climate catastrophe and biodiversity apocalypse we are facing are not technical, but relational problems. And that the mindset that has led us into this predicament cannot guide us towards a solution. So Chief Ninawa also talks about the colonization of our unconscious, how um, modernity and, and, and colonialism has imprinted in us um, um, imprints that, that, and patterns that are, are very, very difficult to interrupt and they need to be interrupted collectively. So this is not a problem of information. It is a, it's, it's much closer to an addiction uh, to be interrupted than uh, just a, a, a matter of giving people information or changing a worldview. Uh, it's, it's much, it, the, the problem is deeper, it's cognitive, it's emotional, it's relational, and, it, and that's why education needs to be deeper, it needs to be from the gut, and we talk then uh, in that sense about probiotic education. So in that sense, if we, we start from the fact that our unconscious has been colonized, the, the, our starting point of inquiry is for socially sanctioned denials. And when you work with education as a problem of information, you just present the information and people then change. But if the problem is denial, it's more difficult because if you present the information that people want to deny, generally they shoot the messenger. So we have to find, if the problem is denial, we have to find ways to bypass the defenses of the ego, the, the defenses of the person. So it's it's a very different way of uh, working with education. We'll talk about that a little bit. But the four socially sanctioned denials are, are these. The first one is the denial of systemic violence and complicity and harm. The fact that our comfort, securities, and enjoyments are subsidized by expropriation and exploitation. They happen at the expense of other people, species, and the land. The second one is the denial of the limits of the planet. The fact that the planet cannot sustain exponential growth and consumption indefinitely. We have already uh, offshot six out of, of, out of nine planetary boundaries. The third one is the denial of entanglement, our insistence in seeing ourselves as separate from each other and from the land rather than entangled within a living metabolism that is biointelligent. And the fourth 
is the denial of the magnitude and complexity of the challenges we will need to face together, which is the tendency to look for simplistic solutions that make us feel and look good and that may address the symptoms, but not the root causes of our collective hyper-complex wicked predicament. Wicked is a term that is used in complexity science for problems that are multi-layered that where one solution in one layer creates a problem in another layer and where people who are creating the problem are also people who are offering the solution. So um, it's very useful to look at wicked challenges in that way. Then um, our starting point too is that um, we, we have three different understandings. And, and again, we believe that different communities, different collectives will have different understandings of things. And I'm presenting the understanding of our collective. So our collective understands colonialism as the imposed sense of separation between humans and the rest of nature, which creates hierarchies of value, which creates subjugation and cognitive affective and relational neurodegenerative impairments. Uh, for example, we see the land as property, um, and then that leads to exploitation, expropriation, destitution, dispossession, ecocides, and genocides. Then we talk about neurocolonization. It's how our ways of thinking, doing, hoping, relating, and being, our affective physiological responses and our libidinal attachments, how we source pleasure and comfort and our fears and insecurities are system systematically wired limited and impaired by modern colonial systems, by our current systems. And then neurodecolonization, it's about moving humanity towards neurophysical and epigenetic regeneration geared towards relational intelligence, the intelligence that indigenous people have cultivated for millennia and intergenerational accountability, which comes from relational intelligence, which means facing our complicity, navigating complexity, rewiring the unconscious, disinvesting in harm, mobilizing reparations, and activating exiled capacities for sobriety, maturity, discernment, and responsibility. That's the SMDR. So I will just go through with you some technologies of inquiry that we have in our collective. There are just four examples of these technologies that help create the containers for us to have these conversations without relationships falling apart and without us drowning in the pain or the anger or the guilt or the shame that may come with it. Um, and these technologies Remember when I talked about the, if the problem is denial, it's different and education is trying to address it. It's different from information. So we're going to be using a lot of metaphor and story, um, also, also uh, being inspired by um, indigenous peoples who are part of the collective and the communities in the South about how to use a different part of the brain to be able to hold uh, the information about the complexities and complicities that um, that are inherent in this work. So the first technology of inquiry that I'm going to show you is the bus within us. This has been extremely important um, for people to be together in a space and, and uh, be present to the complexity of the space. They need to diffract reality. And in order to diffract reality, when you diffract something, it's like light going to a prism, you see, so if a, a ray of light goes into the prism, you see the different colors of the, the rainbow, right? The same thing we need to do with the reality around us and also the reality within us. So we, we call it self-diffraction or psychodynamic self-assessment. These are the technical terms for it. But basically we invite people to see their own complexity by uh, seeing themselves as a bus. And it could, it could be another, um, another image, but the bus works really well. We've been using it for a lot of time. And generally when people use other images, they end up in the bus as well. And the image doesn't matter. What matters is that you see the plurality of responses within you. So if you are a bus and there is a, a, a driver and there are lots of passengers. So there's passengers at the front of the bus that who you know very well, so voices that you hear in your head. 
about opinions that uh, you may have about something that may come from people very close to you or teachers or and but they also disagree right and there are people in the middle of the bus who you you hear sometimes and there are people at the back of the bus who might be trying to hide from you so there there are things that you're repressing might be repressing at the end of the bus and the invitation is for you to look back and, and hold space for the bus, for your own bus. And you ask, what are people saying? What are they thinking? How are they feeling? How they are interacting each other? How old are they? Are they speaking from fear? Are they speaking from trauma? Do they sound like somebody you know? Do they sound like a grandma? Do they want things to be black and white? Do, can they tolerate ambiguity? Do they trust the driver? And as you develop this vocabulary to talk about things that are happening or to hold space for things that are happening within you, you are also developing a vocabulary to talk to other people about what you are observing in your bus and what you're learning from observing your bus. So that creates a situation where when we have a group conversation, people can say, there's a conversation on my bus where one passenger is saying, a, the other passenger is saying B, and the other passenger is saying C, and I'm observing this thinking D. So you can bring complexity to the conversation and people can express things without fear of losing face. And it, when they do that, uh, when what we say generally is that if you can't hold space, if you can't sit with your own complexity, there is absolutely no chance you can sit with the complexity around you. Uh, you are going to, and if you can't sit with the complexity within you or around you, what you are going to try to do is to flatten the complexity, impose coherence in order to have some certainty. And then because that repression is difficult, repression uh, and this editing out of reality actually takes a lot of time and a lot of energy you get uh, very attached to the certainties that you have created by imposing coherence on reality. And then that becomes, uh, that makes it very difficult for people to have conversations when they are very attached to their opinions and they see their opinions as a reflection of their identity. So through the buzz, we ask people to diffract, to make their identities much more plural so that they can relate to each other. And then in, in the advanced methodology of the bus, once we, we, we learn to go deeper in this kind of inquiry, there are several decks of the bus. And in other decks, we have our ancestors, we have the whole of humanity in your bus, we have humanity and the more than human. And in another deck of the bus, you may have us beyond space and time, like not in bodies anymore, right? So you can take the metaphor or the methodology to many uh, many different uh, spaces. And we also have the methodology as a way to talk about learning in a different way using, using images. So we may ask people, how's your bus today? And people may say, oh, I'm just going around the roundabout or my bus has fallen into a ditch today or it's in the garage, there's no gas, there's a flat tire. So you have this um, different ways of expressing that not only uh, give you uh, more possibilities in terms of vocabulary, but also it uses a different part of the brain. And that's what we actually, we need a different chemistry of learning and of being together and of talking if we're going to deal with um, the kinds of issues, difficult and painful issues that we have to deal with in terms of, of the climate and nature emergency and inequalities and colonialism, racism, and so forth. So this is the first example of a technology of inquiry that our collective, uh, our collective has been testing. Another one is a story called The House That Modernity Built. So I'm, I'm going to tell the story while you, uh, well, I'm going to ask you and invite you to observe your bus. So as you listen to the story, it's a very short story, I'm asking you to check what kinds of conversations are happening on your bus, in your body, in your mind, or whatever, uh, in your being, how are these conversations happening? So you're, you're doing multiple things at the same time. It's multiple tabs, multitasking. So I'm telling you the story 
uh, of the house that modernity built. And the house of it, it, needs, it has four parts, the four, uh, four frames that you have in the screen. The first screen is the, the first screen. The first frame is the, is the image of a house sitting on a planet. And in this frame, the house is exceeding the limits of the planet, is offshooting the limits of the planet. So the house of modernity has a foundation of separability, which is the separation between us and the rest of the planet and the rest of nature. And this separability creates a problem because it removes the intrinsic value of life. And then it creates the hierarchies between species, between cultures, between people. And it, without that intrinsic value, you, you have to be producing value inside the house to be worthy of being alive. So to have that external validation that you are a worthy human being, you need to be working and producing value within the house. There is no intrinsic value. In other species, the same. If they are valuable for the house, they are protected. If they are not, they are not protected and they become resources. So there are two uh, carrying walls of the house. One carrying wall is the nation state. The other carrying wall is universal reason. The carrying wall of the nation state reminds us that the nation state was created, the modern nation state was created to protect capital and property, not necessarily to protect people. So what we see is that human rights, civil rights, indigenous rights are generally dispensed or created by the state when there is interest convergence between the protection of capital and the protection of people. It's not just that the state is there benevolent, benevolently protecting the people, but when, the, when it's good for the state to protect capital, um, then it can also protect people. But when it's not good, uh, when, when the two of them are in uh, competition, generally the state will protect um, capital. And this is coming from critical race theory. And it's a number of studies that have been done, mainly in the United States, about um, questions of desegregation of schools, for example. But that theory of interest convergence is coming from there. That just reminds us that the, the purpose of the nation state is to protect capital in this house. Universal reason is the single story of progress, development, and civilization that has the, the effect of killing other possibilities and other stories. So it's a, it's a story that becomes a single story and then creates epistemicides. It kills other possibilities of knowledge and understandings um, that question the understandings of progress, uh, development, civilization of modern societies. And then the roof today is the roof of global capitalism that is uh, focused on profit at, at, any, at any expense. Uh, some people call it necro capitalism. Some people, it's definitely shareholder, speculative, algorithmic capitalism that is very depersonalized. And it's just about producing profit for, for, for shareholders, right? And we are all implicated in this if we have, if we use credit cards, if we have pensions. Um, and it's very it's it's very unregulated and very difficult to regulate. Before, when it was industrial capitalism, government governments had much more control over the regulation um, of, of capital flows. But today, with with the the global market, the speculative market, it's very difficult to control. So, in this first frame, this house is overshooting the boundaries of the planet. The second frame is about the hidden costs of the house. So inside the house, we have unsustainable growth and overconsumption. We have an arrow of expropriation coming from the planet into the house, an arrow of waste disposal going from the house into the planet. In the planet, we have destitution, dispossession, genocide, and also ecocides. Uh, so here, the house is subsidized and maintained by violence. In the next frame, we have the floors of the house. So we played here with Global North and Global South, but we, we talked about the North of the North, the penthouse of the House of Modernity, people with historical discretionary income. Then there's the North of the South, people with access to social mobility. Then there's the South of the North, which is um, people who are in the house and they don't have access to social mobility. And then we have the South of the South, 
that receives all the sewage of the house, people fighting for a different form of existence, like Chief Ninawaho Nikui, who is fighting to remain part of the forest, who remain a voice of the Amazon forest. He doesn't want to live in the house. He wants to live as part of the forest. But then uh, if they come with carbon trading, for example, for the forest, he is forced out of his region, and he is then forced to depend on supermarkets for the food, uh, pharmacies for the remedy, and uh, going to school for education. And what he's saying is that the university is our pharmacy or supermarket and our school. And these are all Western concepts. We don't even consider them like that, but it's important to say it like this so that people understand why they don't want to leave the forest and they, why they don't want the forest financialized. And in the last picture, we have climate change, economic instability, cancellation of rights, uh, creating structural damage in the house. So in the house, we have social, economic, political, ecological, and mental health crisis. And in the planet, we have an increase in violent conflict and then mass and forced migration. So at this point, we ask, do we fix, do we expand, do we build another house, do we live without the house, do we find more planets? And then when we get to those questions, there are generally three types of answers. Either it's the soft reform of the house or the radical reform of the house or the houses beyond the reform. So soft reform, we say more modernity, same forward, same leadership, small changes. Radical reform, it's still more modernity, but then different leadership, larger changes. Beyond reform, is more, more modernity is not an option given the violence required and the limits of the planet. So we need to ask different questions and different answers. The problem is that if we have lived in the house for that for very long and we have for several generations, what happens is that we are, um, that there is our desires and our fears and our entitlements are all bound up with the house. So for example, our fear of scarcity uh, in the house, this fear is harnessed and then it becomes a desire for accumulation. And that desire is harnessed and it becomes a perceived entitlement for ownership. And the same happens with our fear of uncertainty that becomes a desire for certainty that becomes an entitlement to stability. Fear of chaos becomes a desire for control and an entitlement to order. So these loops are extremely difficult to break. So educationally, um, that's why I've been, I was saying this is more, it's not about just you cannot jump from thinking like this to thinking in a different way because we are bound. Our desires, our entitlements, and our fears are, are kind of bound uh, to the house. They have been conditioned by the house. So it's instead of shifting of perspective, it's more like rehab. We need AA for humanity in that sense. Uh, the third example is the merry-go-round. So because we, our fears and desires and entitlements are all bound, we, we, when we deal with the climate crisis or questions of inequality, we generally stay in the circle where we want safe, simp simplistic, feel-good, look-good solutions that sustain the status quo. When we engage with communities that are marginalized, we generally engage in tokenistic transactional ways driven by the optics and by consuming what these communities want to give us and then or, or have available. And then we have this ethnocentric, narrow and limited imagination of what is possible and desirable. So it, again, interrupting this merry-go-round is an educational problem and it's a problem that education, our current educational system cannot uh, cannot address because it actually reproduces the merry-go-round. And I will, I will finish the examples with the example of uh, climate fraud framework uh, that is coming from the Federation of the Hunikui people of the Amazon. And that merry-go-round creates a, a problem for the climate emergency because it gets us um, to not be able to imagine beyond the usual. So we have here a number of patterns in climate solutions that are actually making the problem worse. So the first one is carbon colonialism, where uh, with carbon offsets and carbon trading, we are just uh, externalizing the costs of business as usual. So carbon offsets, they give uh, 
industry the license to keep doing business as usual as they pay other people uh, not to have their forests cut. But that is not about uh, reduction of emissions or reduction of consumerism. It's just business as usual with some license. Then there's L, which, let, which is land grabbing. So there's a lot of land, land grabbing happening in the global south for, for uh, so-called conservation and uh, carbon sinks. Then there's indigenous co-optation also in this process, because of course, indigenous communities are super complex. And, uh, but then the, these companies are using indigenous people to say, look, if indigenous people are doing it, it is OK. Then there's mandatory growth and consumerism which is something very difficult to interrupt. There are absurd promises of carbon sequestration, toxic hope in the continuity of violent and sustainable systems, externalization of costs, financialization of nature, regulatory loopholes, arrogant techno-solutionism and techno-salvationism, the understanding that technology will solve everything, ubiquitous greenwashing and distorted narratives and deceptive claims, including astroturfing, which is the creation of this uh, seemingly grassroots organizations that are supporting some climate solutions, but actually they were created uh, sometimes through AI um, to do that. So in that context, we have all these complexities on our back, like we have increasing uh, weight of the complexity on our back, personal, intergenerational, historical, systemic complexities all weighing on our backs. And we're trying to hold the stick of unstable certainties, trying to fend off the fear, frustration, the resentment, the hopelessness, disillusionment. But then we have this wind of climate catastrophe, ecocides and the possibility of human extinction and the intensification of violence and inequalities. And of course, our backs are going to be broken by this if we don't do something together. So the idea is to have a kind of education that can take this um, weight from our back and put it in front of us so that we can safely lower it to the ground for the land. And then we can collectively hold space for it. So we need that kind of education. So in that sense, we've been looking for what kind of education could do that. Uh, and when we compare modern education, which is educating the head for the body to follow, according to, to the indigenous people we're working with, the Hunikui, um, that kind of education doesn't help with that. So we, we took inspiration from Hunikui education, education of the people of the Amazon, which is about educating the gut for the heart to be filled so that the head can follow. So we took inspiration from that and we created this uh, distinction between mastery education and depth education. So mastery education is, edu is technical education. You put um, uh, tea in the cup, you measure the cup, that is the, the concepts or the content that you've mastered, or it's like um, conquering a peak and saying and getting the dopamine that you get over there if you've conquered it and the, the skills that you have mastered. And uh, depth education, in contrast, would be more about peeling the onion, peeling, peeling the layers of an onion, right? But think about a truckload full of onions. Uh, and then creating a meal with that collectively, or uh, instead of conquering a peak, deep diving in the ocean to discover that our bodies are water, we are also the water that we're diving in, and we're also the toxins we are putting in the water that is making the water undrinkable and unlivable for the other creatures of the water, who are also us. So... In that sense, what we're trying to do with that education is to learn collectively how to walk a tightrope with honesty, humility, humor, and hyper self-reflexivity guided by a compass of sobriety, maturity, uh, discernment, and responsibility. And we're trying not to fall into desperate hope or reckless hopelessness. So desperate hope is hope in the chosen people, a heroic authority, the right ideology, a special practice, or a return to a place and time. Reckless hopelessness is about hedonism, which is about just letting me live my best life. Nihilism, nothing matters. Whateverism, misanthropy, which is the hatred of humanity and the banalization of brutality. So in that sense, the SMDR compass is about 
Uh, so I said that we would come back to this at the end of the, the presentation. Emotional serenity or sobriety, which is about rehab, a disinvestment in harmful condition compulsions, in the raising of our emotional threshold. Relational maturity is about learning to develop relationships grounded in trust, respect, reciprocity, consent and accountability, and our commitment to eldering, to aging and dying well. Then there's intellectual discernment, the capacity to navigate multiple complex moving layers of reality and to respond in accountable ways. And the intergenerational accountability, which can be summarized as the buck stops here. And I said that I would return to the question of hope. So in, moder in the house of modernity, hope is generally hope in the continuity of what's comfortable and familiar. Or hope is that I continue to be protected from the violence of the reality that is necessary for the house to be there. Or hope is an image in the future that I convince others to work towards with me. However, Chief Inawahu Nikui says that the future depends much less on the images, images we have in our heads than on the quality of the weaving of our relationships in the present our capacity to repair relationships, to heal and to learn collectively and to weave the present into a different future. So I'm gonna finish with this, that the hope at the hope worth having is that hope at the other side or at the other end of despair. It's hope in our capacity to repair relations, to wake up, to compost the shit that we have inherited and contributed to, to clean up the mess, to grow up, which may mean to grow down uh, in terms of developing the humility that will be necessary to do this work, to show up differently to one another and to the planet and to coexist differently. So as I said before, uh, we, we, try to, we have tried to create a course that uh, invites people to do that. It's a hard course, it's a six week course that really we say that we, in the first three weeks, we take the, the lids off uh, the, the, the can of worms and we hide the lids and we have to stay with the worms first in the first three weeks. And then in the last three weeks, we, we learn to put the worms back in the land. And if you want to talk about it, I think that that, that is a very interesting course. Um, and, and the ask of the course is so hard. The ask is an ask of rehab and we do a number of different things in this course, including forest walks. And it's an asynchronous course with tutorials that are synchronous, but um, we've learned a lot from uh, inviting people to, to do this process. And I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here and invite uh, questions and conversation. Thank you so much for listening and for, for being open to doing this work. I raise my hands to you, thank you. Back to you, Janet, or Justin. Well, um, I want to say, Sarafa, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. We really appreciate you sharing sharing your wisdom with us tonight and, and the wisdom of your collective. Um, so, Janet, are we going to move into the uh, Q&As now? Yes, we are. And thank you very much, Vanessa. We'll will encourage people to, I know you've had a lot to sort of um, digest over the past 40 minutes, um, and it might be new to a lot of you, but if you have a question, please put it in the chat, or you can raise your hand um, in uh, the gallery view here, and we'll, we'll do it both ways. Um, we've got... Um, We'll just give a minute here for people to sort of um, respond in some way. Maybe I'll pin it back to, um, so if you have a question, please do put it in the chat or um, raise your hand, but we'd have to be able to see your screen too. And maybe we could start with, um, Susan, do you want to um, start us off? Um, I, uh, first, I'll start with a comment. I know the first time I, I heard this and read the book, it was overwhelming. So if you're feeling like, 
wow, this is a lot of stuff for me to, th I don't even know where to begin. That's really normal and natural. <laughs> I want to reassure you the fact that you're here tonight and are willing to listen to this. This is uh this is a, you know, a blessing to us. This is what, this is where the work starts, right? This, this is a sp safe space where we can start talking about that. Um, I, you know, when I was listening, I was, I was uh, just picking up key, key words that you were saying, Vanessa, and like, yeah, that just sort of sprung out and that kind of are, are um, easy for me to latch on to. And one of them is we need AA for humanity. And I thought, oh, yes, do, do we ever need this? And I guess the work that you're doing is part of that healing, that part of that that work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's a comment I have for tonight. But I'm sure others have other comments. It looks like Gertie has something that she's willing to say. So Gertie, if you'll unmute yourself and ask the question, that would be great. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much, Vanessa. A challenging talk. I was. I also read your book with a group of friends. And uh, yeah, it, it was very, very challenging. And uh, But I just want to ask a question about the bus. You know, we didn't dwell much on the bus. And so did you do that in a group conversation or is it just a matter of your your own um doing it your own self as you encounter things or as you think about questions to uh be present to your bus and who's in your bus and 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 uh what's going on how, how did that process work thank you Verdi. it's uh we've been using the bus now in the collective for seven years and, and tracking the how different people use it and i think by now we know that the benefits of using it in terms of opening up different vocabularies for conversation are enormous. Even in terms of um, partner relationships, it really helps when you are in a conflict to see, okay, so it's not just two people in a conflict. It's probably there's a conflict over here <laughs> and a conflict over there and trying to map the different people who are talking in the, in, in generally, if it is a conflict between uh, in a relationship, the ages of the people speaking, because generally there is there are some youngsters there speaking from trauma, and it allows you to actually be compassionate to yourself and to other people's young people in their buses, right? To and, and to bring everybody to a space of more sobriety, maturity, discernment, <laughs> and responsibility, and because it is ludic, it is playful. It also removes the charge, the heavy charge that we have on top of things. And in psychology, there is actually a therapy that is very similar, uh, which is called the family systems therapy, where you have, uh, you map inside of you who are the children who are still needing support, who are the firefighters who come out to to fight the fires, uh, who are the protectors, and then you have an, a better understanding of their psychology, so that they don't cause harm to your other to your external relationships. So, from like again, seven years using it, I can say that this is the baseline. That we, if we don't have the bus, because the problem is that we have been conditioned to be to see ourselves as one person just coherent right and that coherence um, in communication with other people who are very coherent when you get into um into a, a cul-de-sac when you when you get into a, a conflict it's extremely difficult uh to disentangle because you lose face and you don't want to do that right with the bus that problem is solved because you are many and the other person is many, there's much more compassion to go around, right? And to bring everybody to a different understanding. And because it foregrounds uncertainty, uh, there's much more commitment to inquiry, collaborative inquiry into the problem rather than this problem solving thing that rushes things. Right, we can we can sit together in a very different way. So I would encourage you to try <laughs> try using it in the course. We use the bus for everything, and we we also invite people to look for the, some passengers who are there. Like there are passengers who are seeking certainty, 
and they they are good for something <laughs> like some tasks they are the best but some tasks like for relationships they are not very very good with that there are other passengers who are seeking innocence and they are pushing for that and if you don't know them very well uh, sometimes you have a relationship with an indigenous person and you're kind of that passenger comes and takes a lot of the space in that relationship too so when you know they are there you can deal with them you do, so you do the work on yourself so that you don't become they these passengers don't become work for other people to deal with right and then the relationship becomes much easier thanks thanks judy thank you um, we have a, another question from Steve, um, and he says the climate catastrophe needs relational um, structure solutions more than technical solutions. Does this mean new political systems? <laughs> I think that that is part of what it needs for sure. Uh, when we talk about new ways of relating, it's first it's new ways of relating actually to ourselves, our own selves, right? Figuring out that we are not separate from the land and from each other, that our bodies are land. Uh, what Shifni Nawa says, for example, is that um, the climate, the, the, the floods and the fires and the famines that are happening out around us are not just happening around us, they are happening within. Uh, within us and, and in different ways. So partly, for example, our bodies, they're full of microplastics already. That's just the materiality of it. The toxins in the water, the toxins in the food, the toxins in the air. So that's part of how we it's, it's happening within, but also in our unconscious. So if we're not separated from, from the rest of the planet, uh, if the planet, if the land is hurting, if other people are hurting right now, we are feeling it. It's just that we numb it, right? So we, once we open up to that possibility and we, we allow that, that pain to be felt and to move, we, we, we have to hold it and process it without drowning in it. Uh, and that is, that is a, a, an art and a technique for you not to drown in it, because it's very easy for us to drown in it, especially in a culture that says that well-being needs to be free of pain. So we, we, we really run away from pain, and the running away from pain is very painful too, because we are terrorized by pain, and the terror of pain, that being haunted by pain is more painful than the pain we are trying to avoid. So once we, we can do that, we can be present to reality, we feel that other systems, other political systems, from that relationality will emerge, but we cannot think the systems before we feel it. So we need to experience it so that it will come from that. There's no way we can imagine it before we actually do it with our bodies. And that's, I think, a, a very key issue that um, not just uh, Chief Ninawa and the communities in Brazil, but I've heard this here in Canada as well, that it's, very, it's, it, it's not a matter of a change of worldviews. It is a matter of a change, a, a neurochemical, neurophysical change in our bodies that will open up for other possibilities of politics and, and political systems to emerge. There's a question here that's on, sort of is connected to this, and maybe you've already said enough about it, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. It's from Glenn and Jackie. Can you say more about the emotional practices that support the many voices in the bus and how you work with emotions of grief? Can you talk a little bit more about that, although you touched on it right now? Yeah, uh, sure. So we... There, there are different entry points into this conversation, but we also work with polyvagal theory, which is a theory about our central nervous system. And that says that we've been conditioned to operate with emotions uh, in, a, in a specific way, and we need to open it up. Uh, and, and, and so we are processing emotions from the parasympathetic dorsal nervous system, and we need to shift it to the ventral nervous system for it to be able to flow. So basically when we, we process, when we face difficult emotions, um, our, our system within the house of modernity is trained to respond in fight, flight, um, freeze, or fix. So these are the four 
the four responses. And actually what we need before we can fix anything is to just process it and in, in the calmness that comes from the ventral nervous system. Uh, this the, the parasympathetic ventral, not the sympathetic or parasympathetic parasympathetic dorsal. So we've been working with psychologists to figure out how to invite people into a different neurochemistry of learning where they can expand their capacity to sit with their bus and process all these emotions that are there uh, accumulated from probably birth, right? Because our culture uh, doesn't have, uh, the Western culture is uh, limited in its uh, teachings about how to process difficult and complex emotions. We need to learn it in a different way. And learning to process these things uh, is something that indigenous cultures around the world have had to do it because number one, they've had to face the violence of colonialism and um, learn to survive that, right? So that survival uh, is about processing the emotion. I'm, I'm talking a lot about the people in the in Peru, for example, they have plants that help with that. They have practices that help with that. But all these practices are about um, both uh, parenting uh, the young people in our bus, but also um, about learning to hold space for things and, and feel it and let it go, right? So we talk about acceptance without endorsement. For example, accept the things, let it go. Um, about integrating our bodies to be able to um, process it collectively as well. We're talking about achieving um, different levels of conscience and, 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 and um, states of mind by um, sensorial deprivation. For example, when you're fasting or when you go into retreats where you don't talk. Uh, vipassana, for example, or when you um, um, so they're, they're going to dark rooms for a long time, and or in, in one of the communities they bury people and they they keep the the head out uh, of the land. So there are lots of different practices that we've lost in our society, um, or or have not even maybe they even they didn't have them, but these practices. Uh, they activate capacities in our body for things that we cannot even imagine, but that might be necessary right now for us to process all of these things. And, and this is this is through the body. This is related to what we eat, to how we drink, how we relate to the food, how we relate to the land that we are stepping on, how we are going to ask permission or not to go into a forest. Who we feel accountable to or not, who we are neglecting. Uh, all these things start to bear in our personal space when we open up these different channels. Uh, and the bus really helps with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I This is Janet, and I'm just thinking we're getting close to um, our time here where we want to do some closure, but maybe Justin, do you want to frame one more question, either with what Michael's written or your your own? Yeah, I can. So I'm just looking at what Michael wrote in the chat here. He's uh, kind of listed a few different uh, a few different things here, and uh, if you want to speak more to this, Michael, you can. But I, I look at this at things like the Millennium Development Goals, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Laudato Si, the Fair Run Approach. Are these things that you know do they have a role in hospicing modernity? Are they just keeping the ship afloat? Um, how do some of these things factor into the, to this work that we're trying to do? I think these things were really important before it start, the House of Modernity started to crack, right? So it's it, they, some of them served to expand the house. Uh, some of them served to protect vulnerable, vulnerable people within the house. Uh, but we are at a different stage of modernity where the what used to work in the past for the left or for anti-oppression might not work anymore. So what we see, for example, is that moralizing approaches, they have more of a backlash they, they, they are, then they are advancing things. We're we are going through that tipping point. So in we, we call it there's solid modernity, 
where, where these things came from and they were important in protecting rights and protecting uh, protecting the space and in putting people, getting people from the basement to the stairs of social mobility. Um, however, if the house is falling apart uh, and, it's, and if we have the sewage of the house coming through, then we have liquid modernity. And in liquid modernity, it's, it's like it's the difference between dealing with something solid and having to navigate something liquid. And we, we need the different, um, different tools and diff a different sensibility uh, to be able to, to, to swim than to be able to walk. But in Brazil, we have the saying uh, that says that in a situation of a flood, uh, it's only when the water reaches your bum that you can you are able to swim. Before that, you can only walk or wade. So uh, at the end of the day, it, this, we will have to swim when it's time for us to do so. But before we, we get to that point, we can learn from some swimmers. Indigenous people have been swimmers. But the problem is that they cannot teach us exactly how to swim because their rivers are different, but they can remind us that it's possible for us to swim. Our bodies are also made for swimming. And by watching and learning and understanding how we contribute to the, the pollution of their rivers that they are swimming in and their situation of a flood, we can learn much more about the floods that are coming for us. I think I'll, I will end on that note, actually. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And I think, will we leave the Q&As there then, Janet? I think so, yes. Take it away, Justin. All right. So thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. This has been uh, a wonderful experience for me. I hope it has been for you as well. Uh, thank you so much, um, Vanessa, for joining us. Uh, this has been both exciting and, and challenging and enlightening and uh, I, it's going to take me some time to sort of sit with this and work through it and I invite everyone else to do the same thing. Um, I think we have a lot to, to think on and feel through after tonight. Uh, I think that's a good thing. Um, so thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping things before we head off for the night. Um, so again, uh, this evening has been recorded, so we will be sending out uh, the recording to all of you and everyone who has attended. So if you need to rewatch or if somebody had to leave or couldn't make it tonight, this will be made available. Um, also, keep your eyes out for an email coming out uh, probably tomorrow um, yes. that will have some follow-up questions to reflect on, um, as well as a suggested activity to do on Saturday in between our other sessions. Um, and of course, also please do remember that we have both morning and afternoon sessions on Saturday, again on Zoom, that we invite you and encourage you to attend. Um, you don't have to attend both or, or I, any of them, but uh, we hope that you will join as you are able to. Um, so on that note, once again, thank you so much, everybody. And um, I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Justin.